Hello, I'm Candace Kelly and I'm Nick Toma. It's hard to believe that 50 years ago, a storm hit the Wilkes-Barre area, changing lives and the landscape forever. In this next hour, we will remember Tropical Storm Agnes that hit our region in June of 1972. We are working on this project with the Times Leader Media Group. Companion stories are featured on the timesleader.com as well as pahomepage.com. This is Agnes at 50. The fury of Tropical Storm Agnes raged through our area in 1972, changing lives and the landscape forever. Now an Eyewitness News special presentation and a joint reporting project with the Times Leader. This is Agnes at 50. The video in many of our stories you will see in this next hour has been digitally remastered and it has not been seen since 1972. The 16 millimeter film was in our basement for years and recently rediscovered, digitized and enhanced for our special. And you will recognize it by a visible watermark in the upper right corner of your screen. 2822 Eyewitness News reporter Mark Hiller and video journalist Mark Albrecht bring you the sights and sounds of the Agnes Flood of 72 digitally remastered. The worst flooding the Susquehanna River unleashed in the 20th century brought into greater focus with 21st century technology. The inundation from June 1972 as clear as can be in Wyoming Valley communities from Pittston to Nanticoke, a roughly 15-mile stretch. Seen for the first time in 50 years, washed out bridges and sections of the levee system. Also unearthed, footage of Luzerne County Civil Defense Director General Frank Townend taking stock of the flood threat on the eve of destruction before ordering the Wyoming Valley to evacuate. The forecast that we had was for a crest of 27 feet tomorrow evening, but that was as of the rainfall at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Now, you and I believe that it will be higher than 27 feet tomorrow evening. Families flood for their lives from the raging river. We took the children. We got out of there about 6 o'clock in the morning and uh, we headed for higher ground. That's the only thing we could do. Now even more vividly visible, floodwaters overwhelming the first floor of buildings and fires erupting on the upper floors of others. In this instance, a geyser of water shot into the air in South Wilkesbury. And the force of the flood lifted houses right off their foundation, including the Greenbergs. When we came down here yesterday, we just cried for about 10 minutes. Utterly believable. We couldn't believe that our house is in the middle of the stream. Businesses were dealt a devastating blow, including T&F Tire on Market Street in Kingston, as then-reporter Derry Bird found out. Mr. Trangwich, how extensive is your loss here? Oh, I'd say 100 to 150,000. Is there any way you can save any of the merchandise you had in the Goodyear store? Well, we'll try to save some. Uh, of course, uh, some of it has washed down the river. You've gone through other floods. How does this one compare with them, including the one in 1936? Well, in 36, I was taken out Coast Guard, and uh, nothing compared to this. Nothing ever will. For the first time in decades, we can show you what car dealerships dealt with. Vehicles lifted off the ground and onto other cars. Shopping centers were swamped like the Midway and Gateway. In central Pennsylvania, river communities like Danville and Bloomsburg were deluged. Then Pennsylvania Governor Milton Schaap responded in this interview, now uncovered. The, uh, the damage is so widespread that it's very hard to say, well, one community is worse than another. But from the air, it looks like the damage in Wilkes-Barre is much more wi uh, widespread than anywhere else. The following weeks resulted in cleaning up thick mud from streets and separating what could be salvaged from what needed to be discarded. Also seen for the first time in decades, an effort then-President Richard Nixon reflected on. I've never been so proud of America and of the American people as I am today. You're great people. We appreciate your, what you've done for the spirit of Wilkes-Barre, the spirit of this country. Mark Hiller, 2822 Eyewitness News. We have more memories from 1972. We'll hear from those who covered the storm and those who lost everything, yet lent a hand in the cleanup effort. Here's a memory from the late Congressman Dan Flood declaring it was one flood against another and vowing to bring the valley back. With people they didn't know, that was just never heard of. But they got together, they held hands, and they saved the valley. You're watching Agnes at 50. 
Those who lived through Agnes understand the scope and depth of the storm. And for a new generation, you'll see the damage and marvel at the determination of people of Northeast PA to bring the area back. Now, to understand what happened, we must first understand Tropical Storm Agnes itself. Chief Meteorologist Josh Hodel takes us back to June 1972. Here's the satellite picture from June 23rd, 1972. It shows Agnes sitting across the northeastern part of the country. Geographically speaking, it's a large storm system. It started well to our south near Cancun, Mexico. A cluster of thunderstorms moved over the warmer waters of the Gulf of Mexico and became a hurricane. Agnes moved north and made its first landfall in Florida. After that, it moved across the southeastern part of the country and naturally weakened. That's what tropical systems do when they move over land. But in this case, the system moved back out over the warmer waters of the Atlantic and re-intensified. Now it's a tropical storm again. It moved north, makes another landfall in New York and gets absorbed by this upper level low. This upper level low moved out of the Great Lakes. In this process, it ended up squeezing a lot of rain out across parts of Pennsylvania. Most of the rain fell in central and southern PA, uh, parts of Schuylkill County. 15, 17, even 19 inches of rain. Farther north and east, lesser amounts, but still a pretty intense rainfall. This is one of the most costly disasters in Pennsylvania. The levee failure at Wilkesbury happened in the morning. Hundreds of thousands lost their homes and the storm set record flood stages along the bigger rivers back in the early 70s. 2.3 billion dollars in losses. And while we have seen some recent flooding, let's hope we never see anything like this again. I'm Josh Odell, 2822 Eyewitness News. Once the warning was given, it was time to get to work to save the area from the raging waters of the Susquehanna River. And as the river rose, a gallant effort took place on the banks of the river, but despite their efforts, the walls of water were too strong. 2822 Eyewitness News I-Team reporter Andy Mahalshik talks with people who were there, witnesses to the power of Agnes. When you heard the siren, though, the chills went up and down your spine because you realized you had lost the battle against the river. David DeCosmo was a radio reporter and a civil defense spokesman when Agnes descended upon the Wyoming Valley, transforming the usually peaceful Susquehanna River into a monster. And that's when I did the announcement, uh, get out, get out now. All the years in broadcasting, I'll probably be most remembered for get out, get out now. It was June 23rd, 1972. The rains from Agnes swelled the Susquehanna River. The flood was something that was totally unexpected. There hadn't been one since the 1930s. And most people felt that the levee system, which had been increased since the 1930s, would protect them. So there wasn't a, there wasn't a realization that this was going to happen, except, I think, in the minds of those at civil defense. The Susquehanna River breached the levee in South Wilkesbury, despite the heroic efforts of thousands of volunteers. For a time, there was a belief that we, we could beat the flood. And uh, there was a call for thousands of volunteers to come out and sandbag the levees. And we had those volunteers, primarily college students, but. Uh, people from all walks of life that came out and really took a chance with their own lives to protect everybody else. But the reality of what was about to happen set in. We knew that that volume of water was going to reach us and there was no amount of sandbagging at that time that could stop the river. Wilkesbury Mayor George Brown lived in South Wilkesbury with his family. You could hear them say the water's coming up, the water's coming up and all of a sudden we have to leave now in dead silence. It was real. It was happening. The sandbagging at the rivers, uh, moving uh, your cars out of, uh, of the neighborhoods. 
Brown says the flood changed his family forever. We left that house that day with only the clothes on our back, my entire family, and we had nothing. The Brown family, like tens of thousands of other families, returned to their homes about a week later. I remember when we came back, seeing all the mud, cars literally up in trees, the, the fish that were in the backyard of your house, the, uh, the doors were, they were waterlogged, you couldn't get in your house, we had to break the doors down. And there is one thing he says he will never forget. The worst thing was the smell because when the water was receding, it was mixed with oil. And you just get that stench. And that smell stays in your mind and in your nose. The flood destroyed Wilkesbury and much of the Wyoming Valley, literally changing the landscape. Andy Tuzinski is a former mayor of 44. He believes the flood forced the valley to move forward. I think the valley uh, was able to come out of a, a stagnant, coal mining community and unfortunately there was a lot of things that got wiped from the face of the earth by the flood but it gave a chance for renewal. Reporting in Wilkesbury, Andy Bohalshik, 2822 Eyewitness News. The Agnes flood changed the landscape of Wilkesbury. Coming up, we'll take a walk with a local historian to look at the past through the lens of today. And here's another memory from 1972. All ladies with hair dryers in the Wilkes-Barre, Kingston area are urged to contact the telephone company. They are needed to dry out delicate electronic equipment so service can be restored. You're watching Agnes at 50. We continue now to take a look at Agnes 50 years later. Tropical storm Agnes devastated the Wyoming Valley of Luzerne County and beyond. The tragic event was a story that local news reporters began covering even as floodwaters breached the levees in the Wyoming Valley. 2822 Eyewitness News I team reporter Annie Mahalschuk takes a look now at how the story of Agnes was reported. But this is the actual paper that uh, was published uh, on June 23rd. As, as the water was coming over the dike, this paper was Let's printed. Paul Goliath was a young reporter for the then Times Leader Evening News newspaper when Tropical Storm Agnes wreaked havoc in the Wyoming Valley. In fact, he was working at the offices of the paper in downtown Wilkesbury when the floodwaters began to roar through the city streets. At the time, my managing editor, Mike Kwesser, a great guy, he had assigned me to write the lead story for that day's paper. And uh, he came over to me and he said, OK, kid, you have 16 minutes to write this and we're getting the hell out of here. So when you're writing these words, what was going through your mind? Do you remember? Well, well Andy, I'll tell you what, when they sound, when General Town and ordered that siren sounded, I'm telling you, a chill went up and down my spine. I'm not kidding you. And, and everybody knew the significance of what was happening. How did it touch you personally? It was, I'll tell you, it was, it was an emotional thing. Goliath recalls one specific interview of the hundreds of interviews he did reporting on the flood aftermath. I recall interviewing one woman from Edwardsville. She's sitting at the kitchen table in the, in the trailer that she had, and just staring blankly out the window. All the while she talked to me. She wasn't looking at me. She was just looking out the window with that blank stare in her face. The flood wiped out radio stations in the valley. The challenge was getting information to the public in real time. David DeCosmo was news director for WILK Radio. Thanks to a suggestion from an old colleague at WAZL in Hazelden, disc jockey um, Ron Jay volunteered to carry our radio signal on his station once an hour so that we could broadcast flood-related information. And that led to the establishment of a 13 radio station network that I was able to put together and directed for about two weeks after the flood. WBRE TV was also flooded. Our studios and offices were and are still located a block away from the Susquehanna River. This is what our station looked like, inundated with water. John Bendick, who is now retired, led our flood coverage. This is an audio clip from WBRE's 20th anniversary special on the Agnes Flood. My photographers, Tom Smith in the air, Fritz Chamberlain in the boats, and George Monagas, all part of history. There weren't many jackets and t 
eyes to be seen during the coverage of the 1972 flood. Yes, that's John Bendick, 1972, wearing what I grabbed when I left home in a hurry. Reporters, photographers worked this story day and night, and we worked and worked and worked. Charlie Hayes was a photographer at WBRE back in 1972. In the early hours of the flood, he and other staff members broadcasted from the station's television tower transmitter location on Penobscot Mountain in Mountaintop. Well, we set up the camera, and I remember a, a, a reporter by the name of Jim Gray. He was the only person. There was only three of us up there. Hayes says the goal was to broadcast information that could help flood victims or their families. I made a uh, podium out of old crates, and I was on the air, and they would get, get lists of people who were stranded. They were either in Dallas or, or somewhere else, and I couldn't pronounce the names. So I would say, John, S-C-W-Y-O-U-W, and meet your wife in, in Dallas or something. As the flood waters receded, the team at WBRE worked to return the station to normal operations. So we could continue to provide the public with vital flood-related information. When we pulled together, we, uh, we helped clean the place out. The whole basement was flooded, the studio was flooded. It took us weeks to clean the place out. Reporting in Wilkesbury, Andy Mahalshik, 2822 Eyewitness News. Everyone whose life was upended by the Agnes flood has a story to tell about how their life changed forever. Among them is a veteran newspaper journalist with the Times leader whose career dates back to the 1970s who shared his story of going from flood victim to flood cleanup coordinator. 2822 Eyewitness News reporter Mark Hiller has his story. That was our entrance back then. Bill O'Boyle retraces his footsteps on the 500 block of West Main Street in Plymouth for the first time in 50 years. He hasn't stood here since that fateful night in June 1972 when disaster struck. We were awakened in the middle of the night by the Army Corps coming down telling everybody that the dike was uh, compromised, the water was coming through, and everybody had to evacuate and get to higher ground. 21 years old at the time and living with his widowed father, the two men rushed out of their apartment with little else but the clothes on their backs. With the Susquehanna River about a quarter mile from their home, they would days later witness the devastation of the floodwaters. And we could see the water was still here, very high, probably up in the second floor area. The flood wiped out all of their possessions, including what can never be replaced. My mother's uh, artifacts, uh, photographs, anything family re related. He and his dad were forced to build a new life. And I'm not unique. This is what happened to everybody who was in this flood, not just us. O'Boyle and his father moved to higher ground, staying first with his aunt before one of the government trailers for flood victims was made available to them here off Henderson Street. This is where I was, I was living as I was trying to find my way in life, so to speak. It was weeks later after floodwaters receded in Plymouth when O'Boyle was approached by then borough mayor Edward Burns, who asked O'Boyle what he was doing. O'Boyle said nothing like everybody else. Burns said, come on inside town hall. I've got a job for you. That job helped organize a borough-wide flood cleanup, a job for which O'Boyle had no prior experience, but was eager to help. And I said, what we got to do is prioritize a list. So if Elderly people, people without family, uh, people that needed help, we would put them at the top of the priority list. Cleanup volunteers were paid $20 a day. Their job was twofold. Take everything that the people didn't want out to the curbside and pile it up because the Army Corps would come down and load it into dump trucks and then take it off to landfills or whatever. But then they would try to clean the interior and then make it livable again. Roughly 200 volunteers essentially went door to door, helping even businesses get back on their feet. So I sent them down here to Mr. Angelo Grasso, who owned the factory. United Pants Factory on Bead Street was one of those businesses. And they worked here every day for weeks and got this place cleaned up. The work that summer of the Agnes flood was not without risk in unsanitary conditions. But it's work 50 years later, O'Boyle is proud to have had a hand in. Doing what's right for the... Yeah, really. for the community and, and the people. Mark Hiller, 2822 Eyewitness News. 
O'Boyle's work was recognized beyond Plymouth. In fact, he says Kingston Borough leaders contacted him to learn how to speed up their own community flood cleanup efforts. More on Bill's story on timesleader.com and pahomepage.com. Everyone pitched in to bring the area back. A local brewery stopped production to bring fresh water to the people of the valley. And central Pennsylvania also endured the wrath of Agnes's fury. That's next. And here's another flood memory. It has been probably the most compelling force that has driven and shaped the reconstruction of Wilkes-Barre City and Wyoming Valley over the last 20 years. You're watching Agnes at 50. As you can imagine, the foundations of historic buildings were tested during the storm, with many of them withstanding the force of Agnes. 2822, Eyewitness News reporter Chris Bohinski, whose family also endured the flood, took a walk through downtown Wilkesbury with local historian Tony Brooks. By the way, we're in front of the Kirby. Yeah. Of course, the Kirby is flooded out, had to have all new seats, and it was Stanley Kubrick's clockwork orange. According to Tony Brooks, president of the Wilkesbury Preservation Society, much is to be realized about the Agnes flood. It was $1 billion worth of damage just here in Wilkesbury in the Wyoming Valley. An event that reshaped the town. Then there was another building um, to the right here which was the old People's National Bank building. So two buildings came down here. It took a good five or six years before everything looked back to normal again, at least in my mind as a little boy. Um, and what's interesting is the architect that redesigned the square after the flood, Bolin Zawinski Jackson's firm is still in, in, in that building. Originally the Veterans Assistant Building, the old headquarters for the Times Leader also suffered damage on North Main Street. So when the flood hit, Obviously, a newspaper with paper is going to get wet, right? So the presses were completely demolished. There was obviously about eight to nine feet of water on the first floor of the newsroom. Right here in the Wyoming Valley, 80,000 people are displaced. Um, 50,000 of them have to go find beds to sleep on, couches. So it affected everybody. So even if you're a mountaintop or the back mountain, you took in your relatives, your family, and your friends. A short distance away on South Main Street, four numbers on the iconic Boston store, the present day Boscovs, hold a lot of meaning to the city. And I think it's also a sign of the resilience so that we have, matter of fact, all these buildings were still here in the flood. And so that date gives us a date of resilience and a symbol, I think, for the people and how we recovered from the flood. Um, there was a, a lot of effort that was put in with various committees for the flood recovery. So there, there was a flood recovery task force. There was Rebuild We Will, another, another committee. Agnes was a very unwelcomed lady here, <laughs> and she, uh, she cried in us for, well, 14, what did I say, 14 trillion gallons of tears <laughs> flooded into this place. It works right in the Wyoming Valley. We then made our way closer to the Susquehanna River. These buildings during the flood, this was Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, United Penn Bank was full of doctors, dentists, lawyers, architects, bankers, obviously bankers, lots of different type of people. And now today, they're all apartments. They were built so solid and it went through so many different floods. 50 years of history that should be taught to generations to come. If you learn your own local history, it helps you become proud in the place you call home. Reporting in Wilkes-Barre, I'm Chris Bohinski, 2822 Eyewitness News. A reminder that you can see more of Agnes at 50 on pahomepage.com and on timesleader.com, our media partner for this project. Here's a memory from businessman Gus Gennetti from 1992. Because it made the people understand their strengths, their resilience, uh, working together as a team throughout the whole of Wyoming Valley. You're watching Agnes at 50. Victims of the Agnes flood of 1972 remember water everywhere in the communities where they lived. But one thing some flood victims lacked was water that they knew was safe to drink. 2822 Eyewitness News reporter Mark Killer explains how a recent discovery shows us how that became possible. It's seen some better days. It's seen the elements in the basement where it was uncovered. Until recently, what looks like a case of Budweiser beer at the Luzerne County Historical Society sat in the basement of an Exeter home for a very long time. It's, it's seen some weathering, and you could notice on some of the caps as well 
uh, but it's, it's a complete case. They're all here. They're all still sealed. But upon closer inspection, the 24 bottles inside this Budweiser cardboard case... They don't have any sediment in them. ...aren't filled with beer at all. Instead, they contain good old-fashioned H2O from 1972. Drinking water bottled and donated by Anheuser-Busch. It was flown in, uh, amongst other places, in Avoca where it was unloaded and then it was put into distribution trucks. Trucks like this one, seen in a newspaper article that summer, delivering both bottled and canned water. They would set up stations and if you needed clean water and if you you know, had lost everything, you can come and you could get this water. Anheuser-Busch wasn't the only ones donating water to a community in need. 50 years ago, the old Stegmeyer Brewing Company was doing it too. And it wasn't just water it was handing out. The local company, headed by then-President J. Fred Meyer, wanted to show its appreciation to some tireless workers in the flood zone. His son, Ed, remembers it well. We gave away thousands of cases of beer to the uh, National Guard troops that were here cleaning up our streets and hauling everything away. He's the president of Susquehanna Brewing Company now. All right, these two water... But during the summer of 72, Ed Meyer was a college senior with a summer job at Stegmeyer and proud to be part of a company willing to help. I think that's what good companies do if they have a, uh, an item they could help their marketplace out. And that's what you're doing is you're helping your marketplace get them back on their feet again and clean out their houses so they can go back and buy more beer. Meyer has the memories of his father's brewery and others donating water during the Agnes flood but he doesn't have anything tangible of the effort from 50 years ago. Neither did the Luzerne County Historical Society, until now. But to have everything, to have the case, the packaging, the dividers, I mean, the whole thing tells a story. It's a fantastic artifact, uh, and to have it here for the 50th anniversary is just even better. In Wilkes-Barre, Mark Hiller, 2822 Eyewitness News. Rossetti tells Eyewitness News he never thought the Luzerne County Historical Society would come into possession of a case of water in beer bottles. And he plans to keep the bottles separate from the actual case to prevent further wear and tear on the cardboard and preserve this piece of history. While northeastern Pennsylvania was dealing with the wrath of Agnes, residents in central Pennsylvania were also hit very hard by the storm. 2822 Eyewitness News reporter Joe Garrison takes a look back at damage on the west branch of the Susquehanna River. It hit the top of the porch roof here. Kathy Arndt lives in the same house she grew up in along Main Street in Lock Haven. When flood water from Hurricane Agnes forced her family to the second floor of their home, she knew it was time to get out. We came out of the windows. My father flagged down a boat and we stepped into the boat from the porch roof. Bill Hoy was running a men's clothing store with his family a few blocks away on Main Street. He and his brother struggled all night long to move inventory upstairs as rising water flooded the first floor of their business. The cleanup in Lock Haven lasted all summer long. When the water went down, you use a snow shovel to shovel out the mud. And it, a lot of people think flood water is just water. No, it's water mixed with all kinds of stuff. Terrible stuff. The Lock Haven levee system was built 22 years later to help prevent future disasters. But in 1972, the flood water knew no boundaries as similar scenes played out across central Pennsylvania. 31 feet of water in Lock Haven was topped by 32 feet in Danville. In nearby Bloomsburg, flood water filled the fairgrounds. The impact across the central Susquehanna Valley was devastating. A flood control project was completed in Williamsport after World War II. The barrier along the west branch of the Susquehanna River protected much of the city in 1972, but many nearby communities felt the full impact of Hurricane Agnes. The region saw eight inches of rain in just one day, and over 13 inches of rain fell during that terrible week in June of 1972. The Milton Historical Society is featuring photographs to serve as a reminder of how the community pulled together during the natural disaster. George Venios is a lifelong resident. The flood damaged his family's restaurant and the supermarket where he worked as a teenager. 
we had martial law in Milton because what was going on was uh, doors would swell on buildings, couldn't lock doors, so we had National Guard all summer long uh, and a curfew. Ray Leeser of Milton ran a shoe store with his brother. They knew an amateur weatherman who warned the business owners to move out while they still could. Ray says not everyone heeded the early warning. I can still remember rescue boats going up and down Broadway and Front Street and they'd bring people, transport people that never thought was going to be as bad as it was. That is when Milton shined. That is when the people of Milton shined their best and came out and everybody was helping each other out. Uh, there was, it was, it was overwhelming. Joe Garrison, 2822 Eyewitness News. Many people grew up hearing stories of Agnes. Our Madonna Mancione shares her family story next. And here's a memory from former WBRE assistant news director John Bendick. Throughout the flights and throughout the boat rides, reporters and cameramen were strangely silent. I suppose we knew this was to be the biggest story we would ever cover. You're watching Agnes at 50. Of course, many people in our area grew up hearing a lot of stories about how their families' lives changed during the Agnes flood. 2822 Eyewitness News reporter Madonna Mantione heard the story from her grandmother and mom since she was a little girl, and she sat down with them to remember June of 1972. That was my dream house. My grandmother, or Nana as I call her, shows me pictures of the home she built with my late grandfather in Wyoming. It's where they raised my mom and Uncle Al for just a few years until Hurricane Agnes washed it away leaving only Polaroids and memories behind. This baseball field now stands in the place of what was once a beautiful Wyoming neighborhood called Colonial Village. It's where my family and others who lived here lost everything in 40 feet of devastating floodwaters in 1972 during Hurricane Agnes. Agnes brought days upon days of heavy downpours. My grandmother says she can still hear banging on the front door in the middle of the night officials telling people in their community to evacuate. The borough officer says, get out of it now. Don't worry about packing anything. Just save yourself because we're going to get flooded. Instead, they don't know exactly how much what we're going to get. Nobody knew that. My grandparents grabbed a few important documents and left with their two young children. They stayed with relatives outside of the flood zone. My mom recalls saying goodbye to all of the dolls and toys in her childhood bedroom. It was like a scene from a horror movie. Yeah. You were sitting in this car, uh, my mom and dad, my brother, and um, it was dark. It was very dark, and we were scared. Um, and all you could see is just car lights lined up for miles. They would never see their home the same way again. My mom remembers being glued to the TV screen, watching flood coverage on the news. Once the water subsided, they were allowed to return, but it wasn't home anymore. When I walked in my house, I said, this is not my house. It cannot be. I was a disbelief that it was my home. I heard her wail and scream. She oh, just yes. screamed. It was um, horrific. It was chilling. It was... Um, very traumatic. Everything was destroyed and covered in mud. The house was swept off the foundation and human remains were scattered throughout the community from the 44th cemetery. On top of my house there was a coffin. A coffin with the body still in it. The smell mm -hmm. from the mud and the sewer water from the river was just horrible and that smell never leaves you. My Nana, Grandpa, along with my mom and uncle, lived in a trailer outside their damaged home for nearly a year after the flood. The family then moved to their new home in Laughlin. Although it was heartbreaking to rebuild their lives from the ground up, my mom says there was a silver lining. Even though we lost everything, we still had each other. I'm thankful to have been raised by the two strongest women I know, my mom and Nana. Their stories of perseverance and hope during the Agnes flood will live on in our family for generations. The flood is over, but the memory stays with me forever. Madonna Mantione, 2822 Eyewitness News. 
Times Leader reporter Kevin Carroll also sat in on the interview and you can read his companion piece on timesleader.com. Preserving memories for a new generation. The Luzerne County Historical Society wants to hear your stories and here's another flood memory. When there's any heavy rains, torrential rains, you think, wow, this is just like Agnes. It just never leaves you. You're watching Agnes at 50. Oral and written histories play an important role in recounting life-changing events like the Agnes Flood. One such account was given 50 years ago by someone whose very job was to help preserve history. 2822 Eyewitness News reporter Mark Hiller explains. Of course you've this rather large book at the Luzerne County Historical Society is a guest registry dating back decades ago. Amid the many entries by people who visited. Good penmanship. It's good penmanship, all things considered. There's a different kind of entry in June 1972, not written by a visitor. So Harrison H. Smith was uh, our curator at the time. A job by nature is to acquire, develop, and care for historical collections. At a site dedicated to preserving the past, an entry by Smith is clear he was concerned about its imminent future. About 2.20 in the afternoon uh, on the 23rd when everything started you know, really going south, mm -hmm. he began keeping a log. A journal of sorts detailing what Smith described as a momentous and devastating Friday. This is all very neat, this is all very clear. Now it's more frantic. I mean, you could really feel the tension ramping up as he's writing. On page 267, Smith writes, water pouring into basement in torrents, and we are all sweating. And uh, later on, he sort of kind of abandons hope. Smith's final entry that day, good night all and good luck. May we have dry days for six months. It wasn't just those frantic hours before the flood Smith documented. He also wrote his appreciation amid the devastation roughly two weeks later. And he talks about how they come in with the rescue crews and he even thanked them a little bit because they were able to start assessing the damage, they were able to start shoveling and just see what they lost. What Smith provided is a primary source of information, someone who survived the flood with a first-hand account. And this was just something that was by the front door and he knew enough to grab it and start writing. It's that type of account Rossetti still seeks to this day. To have someone who went through it write down their recollections or talk into a tape recorder. Or record a video so that we may better understand the toll of a flood, the likes of which the Wyoming Valley hopes to never experience again. I cannot stress enough how important it is to document it, if not for us as an institution, just for the community at large. In Wilkes-Barre, Mark Hiller, 2822 Eyewitness News. The Luzerne County Historical Society wants to hear your story. Information on how to contact them is found on pahomepage.com. The Agnes Flood helped rebuild the levee. That's next on Agnes at 50. Here's a memory now from former WBRE owner David Baltimore. Every once in a while the picture would start <laughs> to wiggle and we'd all run downstairs and, and refill the, the generator gas tank so it would keep going. You, you never think about it. You're, everything's going so smoothly and all of a sudden Everything went to, to pieces and we'd run down, fill it up, and we were back on the air again. And it was wild. You're watching Agnes at 50. At the time, the Agnes flood was the worst natural disaster in the history of the U.S., but it took more than 25 years to take action to prevent another Agnes-type flood in the Wyoming Valley. A $200 million levee-raising project was finished in 2005, and federal flood protection officials say it did prevent another Agnes-type flood in 2006 and in 2011. 2822 Eyewitness News I team reporter Annie Mahalstrick takes a look now at the levee system now and the future of flood protection in the Wyoming Valley. Get out now. Get out now. Even after the passage of 50 years, the haunting sights and sounds of the Agnes flood still amazes people and brings back memories of a dark time that forever changed the Wyoming Valley. And after a half century, the question remains, can it happen again? The short answer, flood control experts say, is yes. Fifteen miles of levee and flood walls were raised three to five feet in a massive project that was launched in 1996 and was completed in 2005. 
this to protect against another Agnes-type flood. Jim Brozina was Luzerne County engineer and oversaw the project. He then was director of the Luzerne County Flood Protection Authority. The levees do a great job, reduce it as much as it possibly can, but one of the lessons that we learned in 2011 was that everybody believed that there was a lid on the river. It could not go any higher than Agnes. We found out it can. Tropical Storm Lee caused the Susquehanna River to crest at 42.66 feet. That's 1.75 feet above the Tropical Storm Agnes level. The levee did the job, however. What we have found is that because of the number of large storm events since 1996, that what they call the base flood, you know, the 100-year flood, is going to increase by three feet. So the levees that we had designed for, for to hold back Agnes, Agnes is no longer the storm of record. Brozina offers this advice to anyone living in a community protected by the levee system. Well, I think you need to be confident in it, but you also have to take responsibility for managing your own risk. And the way that you do that if you're living behind the levees is that you purchase flood insurance. Chris Bellman is executive director of the Luzerne County Flood Protection Authority, which oversees and maintains the levee system. In uh, September of 2011, uh, we, we had Tropical Storm Lee. If the levee raising project had never occurred, the valley would have been destroyed a second time in a generation. Bellman says the future of flood protection across the country does not entail building higher levees or flood walls. You are really not seeing the construction of new flood protection systems really anywhere. Uh, I mean, the, the trend now is to make existing, existing systems more resilient. Andy Truszynski is a former mayor of Forty Fort. He lives near the levee and remembers all too well the close call in September of 2011. And he lived through Agnes in 1972. Do you have any concern about this happening again, Agnes-type situation? I have the utmost confidence in the levee on which we are standing. The only way that I see that any kind of flooding might occur is if this levee were to be topped. Reporting in Wilkesbury, Andy Mahalshik, 2822 Eyewitness News. Thank you for joining us for this special presentation, Agnes at 50. For extended interviews, including more unseen digitally remastered video, head to pahomepage.com and timesleader.com. For everyone here at Eyewitness News, I'm Candace Kelly. And I'm Nick Toma. Thank you for watching.